I always wanted to do that. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, today is the ongoing Fukushima Daiichi crisis, ongoing radioactive discharges, and other current issues. Um, with us today is Gregory Yatsko, former chairman of the U.S. Regular Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Torgan Johnson, citizen's representative of, of San Diego Forgum, forum that was instrumental in closing down a um, nuclear generating station in San Diego, and the Citizens Commission on Nuclear Energy, CCNE, which invited both of these gentlemen here to speak about how citizens could become more active in determining um, nuclear energy policy and the state of nuclear energy in Japan. We have limited time since two of our guests have to get on an airplane at 11. So uh, without further ado, if you want to know more about this, you all have the handout here. Um, first will speaking is Mr. Gregory Yatsko who was the former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, followed by Torgan Johnson, and then followed by Tetsuro Tsutsui, and then we will take questions and answers. Um, Mr. Yatsuko, oh, sorry, Mr. Yatsuko, um, please go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks, Jake. Um, it is a uh, real pleasure to be here uh, to address you this morning. Uh, I've had an opportunity over the last um, several days to visit uh, with a number of different people here in Japan and hear about uh, their concerns and issues uh, dealing with nuclear power in the aftermath of uh, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, accident. One of the things that, um, that has uh, become very clear to me and became clear to me after the accident began is that these kinds of nuclear accidents that have really economy-wide impact are simply unacceptable uh, in, in Japanese society, in American society, and I think really all over the world. So it it's, gives us an opportunity to take a, a step back and figure out how we go forward and how we ultimately move forward in a way that eliminates the possibility of these kinds of accidents. And one of the keys to that uh, certainly is the active involvement and engagement of the public. Decisions about nuclear technology are often controversial. They are often very difficult, uh, involving sometimes science that has uh, limited uh, consensus among technical experts. And so it's incumbent to fully engage the public and be uh, active on the part of the government, on the part of the utilities, on the part of the citizens. To, to be active participants in, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. We know what the impact of the Fukushima Daiichi accident was. It's 160,000 people evacuated from their homes, some, most of them still to this day. It's a, a significant land contamination event, and it's, it's an event that, at a minimum, estimates have shown will impact the Japanese economy on the order of about 500 billion U.S. dollars, right? I think if I do my math right, that's 50 trillion yen. And it's a, a, an accident that will leave a leg, legacy of cleanup and decontamination and decommissioning that will last for decades. Now, there has been a lot of interest lately, um, internationally certainly, and I've seen that in the United States about the efforts to deal with water contamination uh, at the site, a combination of, of problems from tanks that are storing uh, contaminated water and groundwater migration through the site. All of these issues are extremely significant but they are just the beginning of the work that will need to be done. Over the next several months, there will be activities related to removing fuel from the, the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. This is also a very significant uh, uh, activity from a safety perspective. So there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of uh, work to be done and much of that is extremely safety significant. So that's why it's so important to have the public fully engaged. Uh, there will invariably be setbacks in this work and it's important to have a good dialogue and a good debate, not only to be able to communicate these setbacks as they occur, but ultimately to be able to solicit and get the best advice and recommendations about how to move forward with many of these issues. Every time I come to Japan, I'm amazed by the, the spirit and the creativity and the, the hard work and the ethic of hard work of the Japanese people. And I think it's extremely important to utilize all the resources that exist in Japan to work on solving these challenges because they are ultimately unprecedented. 
the, the accident at Fukushima Daiichi has, has left a legacy of contamination that is, is very different from any other radiological disaster uh, that has happened in the world. And ultimately, we have to change the mindset about people believing that accidents can't happen. Before the accident, too many people believed in that mindset. And that's part of the challenge and part of the important need to change as we go forward. Fundamentally, as I've looked at this accident and as I've talked to people in communities that surround nuclear power plants in the United States, in Japan, it's become clear to me that we need to think about safety in a whole new way. We need to think about nuclear technology being used in a way that it cannot lead to evacuations. It cannot lead to land contamination events. This is something that we wouldn't accept in any other kind of technology. And even though these events are anticipated and expected to be extremely rare, they still can happen. And they did happen at Fukushima Daiichi. So as we go forward and we think about nuclear technology and the use of nuclear technology, it's time to completely remove the possibility of severe accidents. That means a whole new way of looking and thinking about nuclear technology, and it may mean rethinking the reactors that are currently in operation today. So as I've met with people and, and attended public meetings over the last several days, I've challenged the people that have, have come before me to be active participants, to be actively engaged in the work that, that is going to be needed to, to be done in Japan to address the issues with Fukushima Daiichi, to address the very difficult decisions about restarting nuclear power plants in this country. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here with, with Torgan Johnson, who uh, is from Southern California. And I met him when I was working as the chairman of the NRC because of the work that he was doing to organize people in his community and to bring facts to their attention that would help them be informed participants in the debate and discussion about the power plant in his community. And I'm especially pleased to be here with Dr. Tsutsui, who has a tremendous background and has ideas and thoughts about how to address and tackle the challenges of Fukushima Daiichi. And these are very, very difficult challenges. And, and I think if there's any lasting message that I could leave, it's that to tackle these challenges, the best and brightest minds from Japan, and if necessary, from the rest of the world, will need to be brought to bear to come up with solutions. And I think it's very, it's very difficult to say that there's a right answer. There will, be, there will be difficult choices, and there will ultimately be uh, uh, sacrifices and, and, and choices that will have to be made. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address all of you, and, uh, and I'd be happy to uh, answer questions when we get to there. Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Johnson. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to address you in a poetic way. This uh, trip is a full circle. Uh, it started with us watching from California the March 2011 disaster unfolding on television and uh, wondering what this meant for Japan. And uh, three weeks after the first explosions, we were detecting radiation in the milk we were feeding our children in our house in San Diego that that plume had reached the West Coast and was uptaken through bioaccumulation in, in the dairy industry uh, 5,500 miles downwind. I think at that point, my views on nuclear power had shifted from being uh, very supportive of the, the technology to being more wary and wanting to know more about what these disasters mean to society. Uh, so in the process of, of uh, observing and learning about the Fukushima disasters, it was unfolding. Uh, we turned our, when I say we, it was a, a number of, of community groups from San Clemente, California, and uh, up, up through Orange County, all the way up into Los Angeles County, down through San Diego County. It was a number of people, it was a loose coalition of concerned citizens and professionals, uh, include doctors, attorneys, medical experts, uh, people in elected uh, official positions. Uh, all of us were starting to, to tune into this issue at Fukushima and then redirected our attentions at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, which happens to be about 30 miles upwind of our house. Um, and so 
over the course of uh, two and a half years, we organized the public and elected officials from local level to state level, all the way up into the federal level, to uh, take note of the public's position on the risks and benefits of nuclear power, that the public was growing wary as we were watching things spiral out of control at Fukushima. And uh, a number of us in these coalitions, uh, based out of San Clemente, uh, eventually put together a series of city council meetings and started to engage our elected officials. And what we're sharing now in Japan is, is that technique of uh, inclusion, because the public in California included a number of uh, specialists. Some of the people that were part of our group included the man that designed the containment structures, the chief engineer, uh, the designed the containment structures at San Onofre. We had people inside the power plant speaking to us. We had uh, a number of experts that became involved in this broader public discussion. So um, it culminated with uh, uh, an event on June 4th, which was precipitated earlier by a long and drawn out, very complex legal battle that Friends of the Earth US was waging in Washington uh, against Southern California Edison, the owner of the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. And uh, as the lawsuit was unfolding, um, we decided at the public level to organize a conference. We invited former Prime Minister Naoto Khan and uh, former chairman of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, Dr. Yasko, an independent uh, nuclear expert, Arnie Gunderson, and past NRC Commissioner uh, Peter Bradford to join the public and open up a public dialogue about the risks and benefits of San Onofre. And it was a very successful conference. I know there were a number of issues that, that led to the closure of San Onofre, but uh, one, of those, one of those forces was the public getting involved in the decision-making process and putting pressure on regulators, local officials, state and federal officials uh, to take the public's concerns and their, their concerns for their safety uh, at heart and, and really acknowledge that the public is the key stakeholder in these disasters. The public, especially right around the power plant, are the first victims. They're the first ones to lose everything. For many people losing their homes, that is, equates to personal financial ruin. And we started to raise these discussions in, in, in these meetings that we were having. Um, so the outcome after that conference was a decision by Southern California Edison three days after our conference to uh, close the facility for good and decommission it. The Japanese, who we've been in close contact with, asked us to come to Japan and talk to them about what we did and how we organized the public. It was a very professional and, uh, and uh, symbiotic kind of uh, relationship that we had with our elected officials. And I think the Japanese public wants to do the same thing here now. They want to they have a clearer voice. I think it's a healthy thing in planning. That's the approach that we take in progressive planning is you take all stakeholders in the broadest sense and uh, a wide range of disciplines and bring them to the table and let them discuss all these key issues. For instance, the release of 1,000 large tanks of highly radioactive uh, water into northeastern Japan's uh, fisheries. I think, I think the fishing industry needs to be at the table in that discussion. That's a huge issue. I know it'll eventually wind up on my dinner plate in San Diego. That's Thank why we're here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, these two gentlemen were brought here by the CSO, the Citizen Nuclear Information Center, um, Genki, uh, no, Gensuikin, and CCNE, the Citizens Commission on Nuclear Energy. Um, Mr. Tetsuro Tsutsui, who is the Nuclear Regulation um, Subcommittee mm -hmm. representative here, will speak briefly on the proposal that they are making to the Japanese government. Um, and there will be also a, 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 probably he will be doing it in English, and then after that we will take questions. Um, Mr. Tsui Thank you very much. Mm, I would uh, propose three points from engineering point of view. Number one, according to this paper, 
uh, establishing a project-oriented task force organization. TEPCO is inappropriate organization for dealing with this exceptional situation. So we propose the formation of project-oriented task force organization to deal with the current situation. This task force would include expertise uh, second uh, from engineering and construction companies, including experienced project works uh, experts and engineers. The task force would be empowered with a broad range of activities, including planning, budget control, field work management, etc. Number two, underground wall to be built on hillside of tank area. Uh, read this uh, map. Uh, the current METI and TEPCO plan is to build a 1.4 kilometer long frozen wall around the reactor buildings to block underground water. However, the existing storage tank area upstream of the reactor buildings is already radioactively uh, contaminated. Moreover, the frozen wall method is not yet technically proven and requires a long construction period before it can be in place. So we uh, propose uh, the construction of an underground wall using a different method and the installation of reliable storage tanks. The wall would be located upstream of the tank area. The tanks constructed would be 100,000 ton, uh, ton class reliable storage tanks with maximum total capacity of 800,000 tons. <clears throat> the advantage of building the wall upstream of tank area is that, is that it opens opens up the possibilities of utilizing proven technology, the mobilization of many skilled operators of heavy equipment under less worker doors, and mobilization of many such heavy equipment simultaneously because of a large working, area, working space. Point C, plans for removal of debris should be canceled. Uh, the current METI and TEPCO roadmap states that the uh, removal of debris will begin 8.5 years after the accident and be completed 20 to 25 years after the accident. We propose following alternative. The contaminated water problem should be resolved. Spent fuel in the spent fuel pools should be removed as planned. Then we propose that the water cooling of the damaged reactor cores should be continued until the decayed heat is reduced sufficiently for natural air circulation. Subsequently, the equipment and building areas selected for isolation should be covered with concrete. This proposed method can avoid many uncertain difficulties which would arise in the METI TEPCO plan, including plugging an uncertain number of cracks on the pressure cont uh, containment vessels, the need to develop methods to break up the blocks of debris and remove the pieces of debris, the extensive radio uh, radioactive dose to workers the huge financial expenses. That's all, thank you. Um, before, we take, um, before we take questions, um, 
Mr. Suisan, has this been submitted to the government yet, or are you planning to submit it in the next few days, this urgent request? Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we will uh, submit to the parliament members. Okay. Well, this will be submitted to the parliament members tomorrow, assumingly in, in Japanese and English. All right. Now we're going to take questions. I, I would ask that you please not give speeches and just give questions. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, please identify yourself when you ask the question. Um, yes, hello. My name is Daniel Leusink. I'm a freelance correspondent with the Dutch Financial Daily at uh, Financiële Dagblad. I've been based in Japan for six years. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Jasko. Uh, you may have been asked this uh, before, but uh, what do you think of the way former Prime Minister Naoto Kan uh, got the accident, the nuclear accident, under control? And to what extent do you think he was a hero? Um. You know, I, I think um, uh, I've had an opportunity to meet with um, Mr. Khan after the accident, and uh, uh, I think he's ta he took a lot of very significant actions uh, during the crisis. Um, you know, I, I think people who work in government, it's their job to take the right actions in a crisis. Um, I don't think that makes you a hero. Um, I think that's your job. Uh, and, and I think he did a lot of things right. Um, you know, when you have a, a crisis like what happened uh, in Japan, uh, it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, you're faced with tremendous uncertainty. Um, and the more I think I hear about what he did, I think the more uh, people in Japan will value the leadership that he demonstrated. Uh, because there were a number of very significant crises that he, he managed. It was not only the nuclear accident, but it was responding to the humanitarian crisis of a tsunami that had devastated a, a region in Japan. Um, so I, you know, I think the more that people know and learn about what he did, the more that they'll think he did a fine job uh, in, in reacting to the accident. Um, you know, I'm not one to label people's actions, but um, uh, you know, I certainly, I think he dealt with a lot of challenges, in particular getting information from TEPCO and kind of breaking through, well, I think the term that's been used here is this, the nuclear village. Um, and he had to break that down. And, um, and once he did, and he established some very good methods then for information sharing, uh, he put Minister Hosono uh, in charge of, uh, of kind of dealing with the immediate um, ac accident response. And I think that was a tremendous leadership decision on his part. And it really put in place a formula and a, and a mechanism for information sharing, for decision making, that ultimately brought this situation under control. So uh, I, I, I'm really very impressed with what he did and, um, and, and how he responded in, in a very difficult crisis. Next. Uh, Rudolf Stenhout, European Energy Review. <coughs> Mr. Jesko, um, if I heard you well, you're not talking about uh, outfacing nuclear energy. You see possibilities on the, in, on the mid-term range to uh, continue nuclear energy here in Japan, and what, under what condition? Do you see those conditions in place to make that happen in a responsible way? Well, you know, I, I think ultimately, you know, if I look, maybe I'll start at the long range and work back. I, you know, I would, I would say, you know, 100 years from now, um, I would certainly like to see a Japan that doesn't have to deal with nuclear energy challenges. Uh, you know, I, I think given the, the nature of the country, um, this is a technology that poses significant risks. And unless we gen develop a new generation of technologies for nuclear energy that kind of meet this standard that I've talked about, which is the, the elimination, not just the reduction in the risk, but the elimination of the possibility of a severe accident, um, you know, I, I, I see that as a technology that is just not viable in Japan or really anywhere else in the world. And, and I think nuclear technology is expensive. It poses, you know, these 
high consequence, low probability uh, hazard challenges, which are, are really unnecessary. You know, when you look at what happened around the Fukushima Daiichi area, it, it's simply unacceptable. You know, this is a technology that was there to generate electricity. Um, and the impacts on the community are just, you know, astounding. I mean, you know, imagine being removed from your home for an indefinite period of time. I mean, that is, that is a personal tragedy that I don't think any of us can fully appreciate unless we've had to go through with it. So, you know, the, the only thing that ultimately weighs into the decision is how do you replace that power in the short term? And I think that's where the focus and the energy needs to be right now, is coming up with ways to do that without nuclear, if possible. Um, and, you know, I, I hope and I believe that there are ways to do that. Um, and, and I think that's where I would see the Japanese people putting their resources and their energy is on coming up with those technologies if they, if they exist, deploying them, if they don't exist, developing them. Um, and I think the Japanese people have the ability to do that and have shown that as they've dealt with tragedies, you know, over their, over their history. So, um, you know, ideally I think you would not restart any of the reactors. Um, you know, that uh, may not prove practical. Um, if, if any of the reactors are restarted, there needs to be a thorough public debate and a public dialogue to ensure that those decisions have as much buy-in from members of the public as possible. Because if they don't, it's not going to be successful uh, in the short term until you can then ultimately move to, to whatever technologies will replace it in the long term. Uh, wait. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Per Bodner, per Bodner uh, Sweden, photographer for Real Politica. I wonder, can you uh, elaborate on this technology that is planned to put uh, uh, Fukushima plant on ice. I've been listening to uh, or watching on TV on B interviews on BBC, CNN, with uh, experts in these matters, and they say that was only uh, when it's been tested before in much lower scale, uh, it has only been for temporary use, not as a permanent use. Your ideas about this, please. Thank you. Well, I'll say some. Or I will say some things, and Mr. Tsui wants to comment too. Um, I, I think we just we have to recognize that there is no simple answer to the water problems in, in Japan uh, at, at the Fukushima Daiichi site. Um, but fundamentally, what what has to be done is known. You have to divert the groundwater away from the site so that it doesn't continue to flow through the reactor building, get contaminated, and flow onto the sea. Um, or, if you can't divert it, you have, to, you have to prevent the water from getting to the ocean, getting to the sea. So, you know, there are a number of proposals, um, the ice wall being one. I can't say that I have any particular experience with technology like that. Um, actually, I don't. So. Um,